But do we really know how nature works at that level? The level of protons, electrons, and of the particles that form them. Answering that question represents one of the greatest challenges in physics, which since the start of the 20th century has tried to find a general unifying theory that would unite the postulates of classical physics and quantum physics. Albert Einstein dedicated the last 30 years of his life to that quest without success. But at the same time, Paul Dirac, one of the founders of quantum physics, contributed one of the key concepts that supports this discipline, antimatter. Building from the basic premise that the square root of four is both two and minus two, Dirac predicted that for each charged particle, there should be another particle with the same mass, but with the opposite electrical charge, known as an antiparticle. His theory predicted the existence of a sort of anti-universe that ceased to exist in the first instance of the Big Bang. When in 1932 an experiment confirmed the existence of one of these antiparticles, it became very clear that there was a wide gulf between what our senses could detect and quantum mechanics. Antimatter is now created in minuscule quantities in the particle accelerators. In the early 1960s, so many particles had been discovered that physicists suspected that they had to be made up of other, more elemental particles. It was then that Murray Gell-Mann proposed the existence of quarks and, with the aid of other scientists, defined the standard model. So the total standard model picture of matter is six quarks, six leptons. And their social behavior is determined by forces. And the forces themselves are carried by particles. There's the strong force holding quarks together, the electro electromagnetic force, which uh, binds electrons to nuclei to make atoms, and there's the weak force, which creates radioactivity. Uh, so our standard model has these three forces, these six quarks and six leptons. To study the strange world of the microcosmos, physicists have needed the aid of experimentation to obtain the data that supports their models. The largest and most costly machines ever built by man have been constructed in order to prove these scientific theories. We're talking about particle accelerators, enormous tunnels through which electrons travel at the speed of light, driven by immense magnetic fields. At a particular moment, the scientists provoke a collision with the particles that are traveling in the opposite direction, releasing the energy that they carry. The energy that is produced is equivalent to the energy given off by a match, but it is concentrated in a point which is so tiny that the scientists achieve conditions that recreate the ones that were found during the first moments of the universe, generating unknown particles. Increasing the energy obtained in these collisions is what will be attempted at the LHC in Geneva. Its aim is to find the most elusive particle in physics, Higgs's boson. Its discovery would allow us to understand matter. Uh, oh, well, inside the standard model, I would say the Higgs particle is still missing, and we have to find it. We have to, because if the Higgs particle doesn't exist, that means that we have really to revise completely our ideas in this domain. So this is the most urgent, urgent, uh, urgent uh, um, thing. But as I said, we believe that the standard model is only a partial, uh, partial uh, answer, like in the 18th century, the Maxwell theory was only a partial although very complete answer to the structure of uh, electromagnetism, and uh, so we will have to go beyond that. 
That is how science works. Mathematical models are compared with natural phenomena. Out of these comparisons emerge new, more complete versions of the previous models, until a definitive agreement is reached between our reason and nature. This way of operating based on trial and error, which is served to reveal the caprices of inert matter, is the same mechanism that evolution has employed to give rise to something strange and precious in the universe. Life. We know a great deal about life, but we know very little about what is actually essential for life. We do not know how to define it precisely. We do not know the conditions under which it is generated. We do not know if water is really necessary. We think, we suspect it is, but we do not know why. Nor do we know if the extraordinary complexity of carbon-based chemistry, because of its physical properties, is a basic factor in the existence of life. This is a crystallized protein an artificial fossil of one of the basic building blocks of life. Because in reality, proteins are laborers at the service of the basic information of living beings gathered in their DNA. Why crystallize a protein? Simply to be able to observe it better. When we look through a microscope, we get a two-dimensional image. But the mysteries of biology take place in three dimensions, and this is something extremely important in the case of proteins. Each protein can contain between 50 and 1,000 amino acids, ordered in different ways, so the variation in their shapes is enormous. And a spatial difference can mean that a protein, instead of fulfilling its function, becomes a danger for an organism. As in the case of hemoglobin, which when its structure is altered, is not able to transport oxygen and can provoke various types of anemia. And so having a three-dimensional model of proteins is key to controlling their workings. And to achieve this, we can rely on the aid of the accelerators. Inside these machines, the particles must follow a circular path through the tunnel. When they curve, they give off very high energy electromagnetic radiation in the form of X-rays, known as synchrotron radiation. Once obtained, we make the radiation cross through a crystallized protein and we get something surprising. The location in three dimensions of all the atoms that form it. The structure of the agents of life is so complex that we have had to turn to the most sophisticated technology to continue revealing its mysteries. But the human mind, at times, has managed to reduce all this complexity to simple, elegant, and beautiful models. One of these occasions took place in 1953. James Watson and Francis Crick published a simple article in the magazine Nature entitled, A Structure for Deoxyribonucleic Acid. In the article, they proposed a model for DNA the long chemical chain that contains the genetic information of all living beings. Watson and Crick amazed the world with the idea of a double helix able to reproduce itself. This idea was so simple and functional that it just had to be true. But without the experimental data provided by other scientists, it would have been impossible to create this model. Above all, they were aided by seeing this image. Here, in this portrait of deoxyribonucleic acid, obtained thanks to bombardment with x-rays, it was possible to make out the structure of a helix. The image was achieved by Rosalind Franklin, a researcher dedicated to applying x-ray diffraction techniques to the study of large molecular structures. As Watson himself admitted, only on rare occasions does a scientific revolution excite the public immediately. We didn't expect any practical consequences for the world around us, and much less that the man in the street would try to comprehend the data on genes that would emerge in the following years. Despite Watson's initial opinion, the double helix model of DNA has turned out to be fundamental to discovering the mechanisms of life and genetic inheritance. 
It has shown us the molecular secrets of the evolution of life that has taken place on the Earth. But the conditions for this strange phenomenon to begin 3.7 billion years ago continue to be a mystery.